This lesson this morning really ties in with uh, what I've experienced these past two weeks. Uh, we're in the last section of Colossians chapter 4, and it's, you know, it's not one of those passages of Scripture that a preacher or a teacher can jump up and down and shout about uh, some of the great doctrinal truths that we find in the Word of God, but it's uh, rather what it is, it's uh, some verses where Paul's closing the letter out, and, and am I standing too close to that? Is it okay? Probably going to lose some teeth. But, it's, but Paul's, Paul's concluding his letter to the church at Colossae, and in so doing, he's going he's gonna to reveal some personal things about people that he's working with, about people that he's in prison with. And uh, as I said, it's not one of those rip-roaring emotional passages, but, but there's a lot of truth in it, and we're going to spend time on it today, and next week we'll finish the book of Colossians together. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to start at Colossians 4, 7. And by the way, I want to thank you, Chip, for teaching the class last week and while I was gone. Heard a lot of good things about it. Chip's a great teacher. We're blessed to have him. All right, verse, verse 7. Paul says, uh, Tychus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow, fellow servant in the Lord. So he's a brother, he's a minister, he's a servant. Remember where Paul's writing this letter from now. He's in prison in Rome. And it's not, it's not like a, a maritime prison or you might think of our Huntsville maximum security prison. Rather what it appears to be is a house arrest. He's, uh, he's under 24 hour watch by Roman guards waiting the time that he appears before Caesar uh, to present his case. So people are coming and going from that house, and he's having interaction. Now this Tychus here, he tells us, and apparently you can tell by what he says here, the people way back in Colossae, do you know where Colossae is? Anybody remember? It's, it's back in Turkey, right? It's a long ways away from Rome. He's saying Tychus is somebody, you people don't know him there in Colossae, but I want you to know uh, he's a brother, He's a minister and he's a servant. And the reason he wants them to know that is because he's fixing to put down this book of Colossians that he's wrote and roll it up and put some wax on it and hand it to Tychus, who is not a prisoner, and send him all the way back to Turkey to deliver this letter to the Colossian Christians back there. So he's a postman, I guess you could say. Epaphras is a man that's also there in Rome. I'm going to get to him in a minute. Epaphras brought the news of the church of Colossae to Paul. He wrote the letter. Now he's sending it back with Tychus uh, in order to help that church over there. Now this Tychus, it's interesting. Uh, he is mentioned in Acts 20, verse 4, uh, as somebody that was on Paul's first missionary journeys. You remember Paul's missionary journeys? One, two, and three. And he always traveled with other people. They were different every journey. And this Titus was with him on the first one. Uh, he is the one that helped carry the offering that the Gentile churches up in Turkey took up down to the uh, starving saints in Jerusalem one year. They had a famine and they were starving. Titus carried the money with the Apostle Paul. So he's been around a while. I find it interesting, you might not, but the, the very thought of reading verse seven uh, from Tychus' perspective, I think if he would be shocked beyond measure if he realized that his name would be immortalized to the extent that he has outlasted the Roman Empire yeah. of which he was a part. These are people that we're going to study this morning. We're not going to go into great depth on it, but I want you to think about that. These are people that have been immortalized by the Holy Spirit who has inspired the, the Scripture uh, down to the, the very letters and words 
And he has remembered these, these people in this church back yonder. And I think that's very interesting. Uh, now, it says about this man, Titus, let's talk about him a little bit. Paul identifies him as a servant and as a minister and as a brother. Uh, he uses a word that you might know in your Greek, uh, diakonos. He calls him a diakonos, and I don't think he's talking about the office of the deacon. He's talking about the fact that the man is a servant to other people and to God. It's a word that's used in the, in the ministry, or rather in the New Testament this way. Let me, let me give you some examples. Uh, in uh, Matthew 25, 44, a diaconos is somebody that cares for people that are in prison. Uh, in Acts 6, 2, it's somebody that waits on tables, takes care of the church, the widows and the orphans. In Acts 6, 4, it's somebody that teaches the word of God. Now, I'm talking about diaconos, deacon. 2 Corinthians 9, 1, it's somebody that meets other Christians' needs. 2 Corinthians 12, 5, it's a, it's service offered by a Christian man or woman to build people up in the faith. Amen. So that's what a, a, a servant is, the way Paul's referring to Titus here. It's somebody that, that takes care of the body of Christ and is a servant to them. And it's interesting, the Jews, their religion was Judaism. They had no concept of what I just described. They had no concept of a deacon serving those in their, their body, their synagogue, if you will. This is totally new to the Christian church. And it's totally new because we had a Lord and Savior who got down on his knees, took off his outer garment, took up a bowl of water, and washed the feet of his apostles. You remember that story? You remember that? Did that kind of give you an uneasy feeling when you read that? Lord God Almighty, second person of the Trinity, condescends to the floor to wash the dirty feet of his apostles. And he said, this is a lesson I'm doing for you so that you know to be a diakonos, a servant to one another. And that's who we are. Let me read for you. John 12, 26, Jesus. If anyone serves... Diakonos, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant, Diakonos, also be. If anyone serves Diakonos, me, the Father will honor him. So you get it? You know, if you want to be in on this thing that we're calling the band of, of Christian brothers and sisters, it's about service to one another. It's about Diakonos. Now let's go on. Verse 8. He says, I've sent the Actinos, uh, or rather Tychus, uh, to you for this very purpose, that you might know how we are, and that he might encourage your heart. So let's go on to verse 9. And with him I'm sending Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, watch this, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that's taking place here. So here, here we have it. We've got two men that are leaving Rome with a rolled up parchment of the book of Colossians. They're gonna travel mostly on foot uh, to the heel of, it, of uh, Italy, probably catch some type of ship and cross the Adriatic Sea, land in Turkey, and then continue on foot to the town of Colossae. And this letter is addressed to them. Now these two men, we've already talked about one of them, this other one here, Onesimus, I bet you know him. I bet you know a little bit about him, don't you? Have you read the book of Philemon? You know that little short book? Somebody says, are you reading the word, brother? Oh yeah, I read the book of Philemon. You know? <laughs> now listen, it's the shortest book, but it's one of the most important in the New Testament. It's important for our day and time because it's a story about this man, Onesimus, who, was, who ran away. Watch this. He was a slave to a slaveholder, and both of them were members of the church at Colossae. Isn't that interesting? 
Can you imagine Sunday morning worship service? The slave, the slave holder there. But in this case, something happened and Onesimus ran away. And he ran away all the way to Rome. How he met up with Paul in prison in Rome, I, I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But I think it is so profound that it happened because Paul was able to minister to Onesimus and witness to him, probably taught him the Bible from A to Z. Can you imagine being in a, in a, a prison house with the Apostle Paul? I mean, they weren't talking about football and taking the boat out on Sunday. Paul would have taught this man the Word of God, and he calls him a brother who is one of you. Now, the reason that's important is because in the day that we live in, we've got a lot of controversy. A lot of people are wanting to bring up uh, that, that people today should pay reparations to people that were slaves 150 years ago, and no one in either family has ever been a slave. Uh, we've got a lot of confusion about that in this, in this day and time that we live in. And sometimes they say in the meanness, they'll say, well, the Bible condones slavery. They'll say, the Bible doesn't outlaw slavery. Well, it doesn't. But I want to tell you something. The Bible is responsible for the overthrow of slavery. Yep. And this is how they did it right here. It was the identification of both slave and slave owner as brothers in Christ. That when they sat together in church and were taught the word of God, the concept gradually filtered out from church to church to church across the Roman Empire. And by 300 AD, when Constantine took the throne, Rome outlawed slavery. And it was because of this. The scripture doesn't teach a violent overthrow of society. It teaches the fact that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all made in the image of God. And that ought to determine the way you treat people. And that's what it was. So Paul is sending this man back. You think he was nervous? He's sending him back to his owner in uh, Colossae. And he's telling him, take this book of Colossians with you and let the church there read it. But you take it as a brother of Christ. Verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. Okay, we're going on here. We talked about Tychus, we talked about Onesimus. There's a third guy that was there when this book of Colossians was written in Rome. Aristarchus, and he's a prisoner. He's not like the first two that I've mentioned. He's someone that was in prison along with Paul in that house. And he sends greetings back to the church at Colossae and he mentions somebody else, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you've received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. You know Mark, don't you? Mark, sometimes he's called John Mark. He's kind of a famous guy, eventually. First of all, he was infamous. He's the one that went on the missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. And they got a little ways out, a few... Uh, 100 miles away from home. I don't know what was going on, but it was tough. Work was hard. And Mark just pulled up his stakes and he left them and he went back home to Jerusalem. You remember that? Yeah. Uh, Acts 13, 13. Paul and his companions went out to sea from Paphos and they came to Perga. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Well, that is just a short description, but it was major in what the consequences were because it, it upset Paul so much that he didn't want anything to do with John Mark thereafter. The Barnabas, uh, son of consolation, he seemed to be the kind of guy that when people were fussing between each other, he was, he was the kind of guy that would try to get them to forgive and forget, get back together, let's get to work, let's go on with ministry. And Paul wasn't that way. Paul carried a grudge about John Mark for several years. Well, here he is. Here he is now. Verse 10. Mark, 
John Mark, if you will, is in Rome ministering to Paul, the one who had rejected him. See, they'd made up. They'd forgiven one another. He was with him. And along with him was Aristarchus, who was also a prisoner for Paul there in verse 10. You know, I don't know much other than what the scripture teaches us about this background story about Mark and the ministry. I'd like to know more. You know, by the way, I read a devotional this week that really grabbed me. Uh, it was talking about heaven. Uh, we all talk about heaven, don't we? we? We've got ideas, don't we, of what it's going to be like and all that. But this particular devotional grabbed me because, you know, a lot of times people say heaven is forever. It's for eternity. And it is. But, you know, if you don't say anything more than that, people, it's hard to have a concept of living forever up there in heaven. What are we going to do? And the story that I read was by a particular man that had just suffered the loss of a loved one in his family. And he put it in the context of, uh, by all rights, at this point, there are already several billion people that are in heaven. If I'm talking about the Old Testament saints and I'm talking about the church age, this 2,000 plus years that we've lived in, and you've got hundreds of millions of Christians that have lived and died and are gone to heaven, the dead in Christ, if you will, we've got, they say, about 1.4 billion people in the world right now that, that name the name of Christian for themselves. Now, I don't know if they're all saved or not, but I'm just trying to give you the numbers to think about. And what this devotional was that I read about was that uh, won't it be good to get to heaven and spend time with Jesus and meet him face to face and talk to him, obviously, number one thing we want. But then you look up and you see these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of saints. Some that you know their names. Some you've never heard of. But you can sit down and ask them to tell you their story and their testimony of their life and what it was like to love Jesus wherever they were in Africa, Asia, Tibet. And you're not going to be pushed for time. If you want to sit with them for five years and get their story, you can. And then you've got another of the hundreds of millions over there that you see. You think, I, I want to hear his story. And so you can get a concept of what eternity is for. I believe heaven's going to be like that. I believe it's also going to be a time that we study the Word of God. Forever. Amen. I don't think we're ever going to plumb the depths of the Word of God. It's going to be something to see. Well, I got off on a rabbit there, and I apologize. But talking about John Mark, John Mark, <clears throat> by the way, John Mark, you remember the story the night Jesus was arrested, and there in Gethsemane, and all the soldiers came arrested, and it said all the disciples all fled. And they ran away. You remember that? It's a curious thing in the Gospel of Mark. It also says there was somebody else there who the soldiers reached out and grabbed his robe and he ran away naked. I believe that was John Mark. I believe the Last Supper took place in the home of John Mark. But we'll talk about that on another day. The point is that this Mark is in prison with Paul as he completes the book of Colossians and gets ready to send it out. Now verse 11 says, Jesus, who's called Justice, is here with me. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they've all been a comfort to me. 
And so, you know, as we go through these verses, you're starting to get a picture. This prison life was full of people with Paul. They were there. Some of them were there against their choice, but most of them, it appears, were there because they, they loved Paul. And they wanted to help. And they wanted to hold him up and pray with him. Talk about this letter of Colossians that he was writing that we've been studying for so long. Now, Justice, uh, his name is Jesus, but they called him Justice, and we don't know a thing about him other than this. He's not mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament, uh, but we know he was there to come for Paul. <coughs> now, Paul makes an interesting statement here that I want to take a couple of minutes, <coughs> excuse me, and talk about. He says these three were the only ones of the circumcision that are here with me, implying that everybody else that was there was a Gentile. And he's gonna, he's gonna name some more here in a minute. But these three uh, are the only Jews of the circumcision that are there with him. Physical Jews. Now, the reason this is important is that Paul calls these men fellow workers from the circumcision. We all know what that is. That in this case, he's talking about the ones that have been physically circumcised at birth, real Jews. He's not talking about people that are spiritually circumcised as they accept Christ, which he does talk about in the book of Colossians in another place. The reason I'm wanting to say a word here is because there is what I believe to be a false doctrine out of the church at large. Not here, but at large. And that is called replacement theology. Replacement theology says that God is done with the Jews. That they rejected Jesus and God is upset with them and he's done with them. And he's, he's taken all of those promises and all the covenants and all the glorious word of God. He's, he's, he's taken it away from him and he's, he's come over here and given it to the church. That's called replacement. The church has replaced Israel. And that's wrong. And it's, uh, it's taught in the Catholic Church. It's taught in Reformed Christianity. It's taught in the mainline Christian denominations. And I just think it's wrong. That God is not through with Israel. Paul, right here in the middle of writing the New Testament, book of Colossians, is calling them workers from the circumcision. He still recognizes Israel in this place. I always encourage people, because I don't have time to address it here, but on this subject of replacement theology, if, if you want to learn about it, if you want to know a little bit about it, I encourage you to go home and study Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Because those three chapters, the Apostle Paul goes to great length. First of all, he identifies himself, chapter 9, that I'm a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee. And then, he makes the case in those three chapters that in the last days that God is going to save Israel. Matter of fact, he says he's going to save all of them. Yeah. So if you doubt what I'm saying, I encourage you to read those three chapters and come to your own conclusions. Number one, it teaches that Israel is still in God's plan. Number two, it teaches that God is not through with them. And number three, it teaches he's going to save them after the tribulation happens. So that's a, just something for your extra uh, study if, if you care. Now, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, he greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you might stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. Remember, we've talked about this man before, Epaphras, back in Colossians 1, 7. He's the one that at some point in time, way back there, probably, this is just a guess here, either in the 
Ephesus or somewhere, he heard Paul preach and he got saved. And then he went back to his hometown, Colossae, and he shared the gospel, probably with his family, maybe his friends, and he started the church of Colossae, the Baptist did. And then we rock on just a little bit of time, and evidently Paul's teaching was coming to the church, and he was worried about it, right? And he wondered, what am I supposed to do? Well, he, he determined evidently, the best thing I can do is to just pack my bags and make it to Rome and tell the Apostle Paul what's going on here. And sure enough, he did, and Paul wrote this letter that we've been studying to counter everything wrong that was going on in Colossae. So now Paul's turned around blessing this man. He says he's one of you. That means he's a member of their church. And he's over here with me in Rome, you understand? He's over here. And he's laboring for you in prayer. And he uses strong language that he's always struggling on your behalf in his prayers so that they might stand up and be strong and mature and know the will of God. You know, prayer is hard. Prayer is one of the hardest things. And I appreciate Paul saying this, that it's a mighty struggle for this man of God to have us. Uh, I think that helps all of us to understand. When you have trouble praying, and you can't just, you just pray, and you just don't think like anybody hears you, it's bouncing off the ceiling. When you have conflicting thoughts and temptations while you pray, when you just suddenly realize, my gosh, this is Friday, and I haven't prayed since fill in the blank. Things like that are what I'm talking about. Prayer is hard. And the reason it's hard is because it is at the heart of the spiritual relationship we have with Christ. It's how we know him and he knows us. Prayer is the instrument that God has placed in this, this time that we live in right here for us to influence this world. They say that prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Amen. I believe that. Prayer is to be part of our Christian life. And I appreciate greatly Paul's emphasis on it. And I want to say it like this. It's because, you know, there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of different w ways to minister to serve Jesus in this world. Some of them are kind of out in front and, and uh, vocal and noticeable. But there's the people that pray that are humbly on their knees with no visibility in society, no recognition maybe even from the church, that are praying for our church and for each of you that are praying for the gospel ministry to succeed. And I just wonder, I really do, when we get to heaven and they recognize and reward uh, the saints, which they will, all of us will be there. How much the prayer warriors are gonna receive? And that's a happens right here. Paul says, I bear in witness that he worked hard for you in verse 13 and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. There's three towns mentioned in the book of Colossians. They're all within 15 miles of each other. Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea. They are just right in the road there. They're close, they're neighbors. We know from reading Paul's epistles that when the church of Colossae would read Paul's letter, Paul himself told them, I want one of them to take this letter over there to Laodicea 
So next Sunday when they have church, they can read it too. You understand? That's how they did it back then. Everybody didn't have a Bible like we do now. And Hierapolis too. That's how they learned the Word of God. Now, Epaphras was involved in helping this book to get written. He's not going to be the one that carries it back to Colossae, but he's going to stay there in Rome. And Paul says he's working mightily, working hard for you. And for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis, well, how's he doing that if he's in Rome? How's he helping them? Well, the answer is clear. It's verse 12. Epaphras is praying for that church back there. He's the one praying for it. And if you and your heart scoff at that idea as being not important, friend, I want to tell you something. There's going to come a time when our spiritual eyes are opened up, and I believe we're going to be shocked at the power of prayer. We're going to be like Elijah back there with the Holy Spirit opened up his, uh, his slaves' eyes. And they can see the mountains of God and all the armies and the angels and everything. I believe when the day comes that we're gonna have, we're gonna be surprised, maybe, maybe shocked, maybe you won't be, but I bet some of you will be, that prayer was central to what God was doing in this world to bring people to Christ and to bring Christian people to maturity. And that's what verse 13 is all about. All right, we need to stop here. We'll pick up next week at verse 14. By the way, I forgot to mention, when we were talking about John Mark, did you know he's the one that wrote the Gospel of Mark? I wanted to be sure you understood that. That one that was rejected, that went home from the trip, he wrote one of the four Gospels of the Bible. Isn't that an amazing story of being restored and brought back? All right, let's pray together. Father, I thank you this morning to be in your house. Lord, we are humbled to be in the presence of a holy, loving, and faithful God such as yourself. I ask you this morning, Lord, I ask you please to take the stories of these men that help Paul, help us to meditate upon them this week, I pray for the uh, spiritual benefits of each of them that we might learn something from. I pray and ask you that the prayer ministry of the Paphos would become real to us and would become part of our ministry in this world. I pray and ask you, Heavenly Father, to have mercy upon us when we fail you and when we sin against you. I pray for your forgiveness and your cleansing. We ask, Lord, for your strength just ask, Lord, that we might walk with you hand in hand this week. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.